The North Highway Our division had been on the march since early morning. For many hours the trucks had been rumbling past the smoking ruins of houses. There were corpses of people lying on the roadside. The soldiers looked at them closely with growing excitement. Those were the remains of soldiers of Siberian and Mongolian regiments, apparently having seen the dead Red Army soldiers with mongoloid features, Kazakhs, Kyrgyz, etc. The author decided that they were Mongolian. The author decided that these were Mongolian regiments. There were no such regiments on the Soviet German front, although Mongolia, in solidarity with the USSR and in accordance with the Treaty on Mutual, assistance of March 12, 1936, declared war on Germany already on June 22, 1941. There were no special Siberian regiments either, who left their family homes in the east to defend the borders of their state in the west. From somewhere in front came the ominous rumble of a close battle. Kleist's tank wedges had already penetrated deep into enemy territory. Advancing along the northern highway, they came almost close to Kiev on July 11th, having passed 110 kilometres in two days. The advanced units of the first tank group came to the Irpin River, 15 to 20 kilometres west of Kiev. Ed. Having recovered from the sudden blow, the enemy practically surrounded Kleist's tank group, frozen in place, like a mighty rock among raging waves, without fuel and ammunition, which had not had time to bring. Our division was tasked with clearing the northern highway of enemy troops and delivering fuel to the tank vanguard. So far we had not seen any enemy aircraft, but we had already heard the first salvos of Soviet artillery. Several shells exploded in a grove near our column. The battalion commander called the adjutant to him and ordered him, taking two men to assist him, to scout the approaches to the North Highway. The young lieutenant pointed to his driver and to me. We drove through hilly terrain, past fields of ripening wheat, abandoned huts with rain-washed brown and blue walls and thatched roofs. From time to time the lieutenant checked the map. Suddenly he turned to me and spoke in an unnaturally strained voice. And the map doesn't lie. When I looked at the officer, I was surprised to see large drops of sweat on his forehead. We had long since lost all contact with our battalion, having gone six kilometres deep into enemy territory. There was peace and quiet around, the atmosphere of a quiet, happy Sunday. Even the noise of a distant tank battle had ceased. We drove to the top of a high hill, from where we had a magnificent view of the vast space that stretched for many kilometres. Almost at the horizon, a wide grey strip, the Northern Highway. Above it hung thick clouds of dust. The Ivans are pulling up reinforcements, the lieutenant stated, finally getting over his initial excitement and fear, and ordered the driver to turn back. Meanwhile, too, our battalion was gradually advancing and we met it halfway. The officer reported the results of the reconnaissance and our car led the column. When we reached the top of the hill again, the dust in the distance had already settled and evening twilight had set in. Without stopping, we kept moving. There was no sign of the enemy. The personnel were in high spirits and having a good time. The sergeant sitting next to me cheerfully stated, the personnel were in high spirits and having a good time. The sergeant sitting next to me said cheerfully, in six weeks we'll be in Moscow, just so long as the Ivans run fast enough. From the top of my truck, I admired the peaceful landscape, trying my best to fight a strange uneasiness. I didn't recognise myself. Not new to war, I knew its purpose. We were to withdraw the threat from the east, to eliminate it once and for all. And yet, in the face of this vast expanse of land, I was overcome by a feeling of deep depression and fear, the kind of fear that one feels when one senses a trap being laid. All this was, of course, ridiculous and silly, and contrary to the facts. Our armies everywhere were victoriously advancing. German tank groups were unstoppably rolling forward, smashing and chasing the disorderly retreating enemy troops. It was not smooth already in the first weeks of the war. 
on the southern section of the Soviet-German front was primarily a tank battle in the Brody, Dubno area. Only the uncoordinated counterattacks of Soviet mechanized corps and air superiority of German aviation allowed the first tank group to fight back. Ed. Gradually the air became clearer, the haze of the day disappeared, and the surroundings were clearly visible. Evening was falling on the broad plain, and the shadows of night were already falling on the marshes and groves we were passing. But now there were cheers. We had reached the highway. On either side a dense forest stretched out. The talk stopped and the songs fell silent. There was silence all around, not a single shot, and we kept moving. Our vehicle was now in the general column of the second. The battalion commander gestured to us, and I heard him order the lieutenant to ascertain the situation at the nearest crossroads. Take the motorcycle, it is more manoeuvrable, the commander advised. With a nod, the lieutenant invited me to follow him, and we sped off on the motorcycle into the darkness of the night ahead of the battalion. I regained my former confidence. We passed one kilometre, two, three. From behind we could soothingly hear the noise of the battalion following us at full speed. Suddenly the lieutenant ordered us to stop. In front of us lay a fork in the road, and on the right, half in a ditch, was an armoured vehicle, a Russian one. Our tanks deftly dealt with him. The Evans left him and ran away, the lieutenant said, smiling, taking his time to light a cigarette, and pointing at the open door, then, running his hand over the rivets, added, Crappy job. In the meantime, I too walked over to the armoured car and peered through the open door inside. Still, it doesn't feel good, I said, backing away. The lieutenant laughed and wanted to inspect the interior of the enemy vehicle thoroughly. In the meantime, I stepped aside, wishing to ascertain whether the battalion led by the commander was catching up with us. At that moment, a shot rang out. The lieutenant turned around, an expression of utter amazement on his face, and immediately fell down. A second later, the armoured car came to a stop and pulled into the road. In an instant, obeying the instinct of self-preservation, I and the motorcycle driver rolled into the ditch, a long machine gun burst piercing the air above our heads. Before we could think of anything, the enemy vehicle disappeared into the darkness of the night. You all right? The driver shook the lieutenant by the shoulder. No response. I tried lifting his heed, but my palm felt something wet. Despite the danger, I risked turning on my pocket flashlight briefly, a second enough to see a neat hole in the middle of the young lieutenant's forehead. Ready, the driver whispered and swore foully. We hurried back, but suddenly that way, where we supposed the battalion to be, a furious and indiscriminate firing broke out. Utterly confused, we looked at each other in bewilderment. The best thing for us is to stay put, the driver remarked. The firing ceased as suddenly as it had begun. It was with great relief that we heard the noise of the battalion approaching. A few minutes later, the commander's car pulled up beside me. When I, still reeling from the shock, reported to him what had happened, he began to shout at me at the top of his voice. What words he uttered, I do not know to this day. Soon the battalion was on the road again. By that time it had become so dark that it was hardly possible to distinguish anything further than one metre away. Suddenly, deafening shots cut through the quiet night, and at once an unimaginable commotion arose. Loud, jerky commands were heard. A young officer rushed past me, shouting, Soon the battalion was on the road again. By that time it had become so dark that it was hardly possible to distinguish anything farther than one metre away. Suddenly deafening shots cut through the quiet night, and at once an unimaginable commotion arose. Loud, jerky commands were heard. A young officer rushed past me, shouting, Hurry up, don't stop, all cars to the side of the road and form a carriage. Soon the heavy trucks turned away in a tight column, away from the dangerous crossroads. The enemy's machine guns began to sound, and the groans and cries of the first wounded were heard. 
The self-propelled 37mm anti-aircraft guns ahead of the column turned in a chain and returned fire. Machine gun crews occupied the gaps between them, creating an unbroken line of defence. Hiding behind heavy trucks, the soldiers tried to spot the enemy. All the chaos of sounds overlapped the characteristic shots of tank guns. The Russians' light tanks were firing. Despite the impressive number of tank forces in the five western military districts, 12,178 as of June 22nd, the bulk of Soviet tanks were T-26 and BT light tanks and T-37 and T-38 tankettes. There were 508 KB heavy tanks and 967 T-34s, some number of obsolete medium and heavy, with weak armour, tanks T-28 and T-35. One of the trucks filled to the top with ammunition burst into flames, but miraculously the fire was quickly extinguished. The enemy shelling kept merging, rumbling and rumbling from everywhere. Gradually we realised that we were surrounded. Together with a few soldiers I didn't know, I lay in a roadside ditch and kept shooting into the darkness, illuminating it with strings of tracer bullets. Someone touched my shoulder. It was Cowl. We're screwed he said hoarsely. We need to get these bastards out of here first and wait until morning, I tried to joke. Cowell was staring me straight in the face, the whites of his wide open eyes reflecting the flaring glow of the ruptures. Are you scared? I asked in a low voice. If you had to go through as much as I have. Cowell smiled bitterly. You wouldn't be afraid of anything anymore. Of course, I would like to stay alive. You know, my wife... My wife and I haven't been doing well lately, but there are still children. Don't talk nonsense, I interrupted him. You're not so easy to send to the other side. Easier than you think, Cowell grinned. I need to take a leak, I said, getting up. Don't do something stupid. Don't be an idiot. Cowell tried to stop me. I ducked a little into the wheat field, the ears hiding me up to my shoulders. Before I could manage my need, a human figure emerged from the darkness a few metres away. Be careful, I shouted. There's a lot of stuff flying around here. Suddenly I noticed a figure raising a hand grenade above my head. With a cry of, Ivan! I threw myself flat on the ground. At that moment, a line from Cowell's automatic rifle sounded. Without making a sound, the Russian fell and in a moment I had already taken cover again in the roadside ditch. Cole looked at me without any expression. I didn't know what to say to him. I couldn't find the words. You know, I joined the military in 1939, he explained calmly. I was in charge of, you know, an SS unit in a small town. There was no other occupation there. But it didn't change me at all. I was still the same weak and dullard. Then I decided to temper his character and enlisted in the elite SS unit Deadhead. So, I mumbled, still reeling from the shock. That's exactly what I told myself at the time. In spite of some disappointment, I never stopped hoping to take part in the real thing. But I had to serve another year as a concentration camp guard. You know, a lot of what is told is far from the truth, or at least greatly inflated. But even what was real is bad enough. A lot of people crammed into a tiny space for years. Over time, I developed quite a friendship with one of them, a Polish professor. And then one day he was working with everyone else as usual, but then he suddenly headed for the camp fence. Shoot, he asked me calmly. Come on, shoot. I haven't the strength to bear it any longer. Stop, I shouted in terror, raising my rifle and taking aim. We had strict orders about this, but he was already too far away, neither saw nor heard me. He had already mentally passed into the next world. Stop, for heaven's sake, stop. You know the order, I shouted again. Cowell was silent for a moment. He crossed the boundary of the forbidden zone, closing his eyes. I couldn't shoot. I was unable to... The guard on the other side of the fence pulled the trigger. I wrote to Himmler, to anyone who could offer any protection. I wanted to get to the front at all costs. I didn't want to be a prisoner. In the end, I got what I wanted. After all that, here for me. 
Cal pointed with his eyes at the darkness of the night, speckled with the dots of tracer bullets and the flashes of bursts. Is paradise. You're just a little nervous, I said with concern. You don't know what you're saying, Cowell grinned bitterly. Meanwhile, the Russians continued to tighten the encirclement ring. The shelling became more intense. Some... The officer, pointing at me, Cowell and another soldier, commanded... Let's get some shells for the 105mm guns. Box after box, we carried ammunition to the guns that had taken up position in a deep ditch to our right. Nearby, at the edge of the road, was a large calibre machine gun. Whenever it started to fire, the enemy infantry fire stopped. I exchanged a few words with a field sergeant who was adjusting the fire of the 105mm guns and praised us for our speed in delivering ammunition. After perhaps the tenth walk, I squatted at his feet and lit a cigarette. Suddenly his knees buckled and he fell to the ground. Right in the head, Cowell whispered as he rolled the lieutenant over onto his back. The guy was lucky, an easy death. He was replaced by one of the nearest non-commissioned officers. When we returned with another load of shells, he too, to my horror, was already lying breathless beside the field officer. You see, this is how I always imagined the SS in my dreams, Carl said melancholically. I didn't think of concentration camps or the Gestapo or the security police, but of brave soldiers who fight and die in the line of duty. He added sadly, no barbed wire fences, no crematoriums, no soul gouges. Cars with tightly closed bodies, where exhaust gases were discharged, quickly killing the people placed in the body. Dushagupka was invented in 1936 by I.D. Berg, head of the Administrative and Economic Department of the NKVD Directorate for Moscow and the Moscow Region, shot in 1939. Ed. In total confusion, I couldn't find anything to say to him. In a second, our carriage was hit by several volleys of enemy batteries, but our self-propelled guns quickly silenced it. Toward morning, rumours spread as if all units of our division were surrounded and radio communication with them ceased. Soon the following was broadcast over the chain commander's order. An enemy attack is expected at dawn. According to the order, the battalion must hold an important crossroads. Retreat or surrender is out of the question. All of you saw yesterday the disfigured bodies of your comrades and know what awaits you. By morning, the enemy shelling suddenly stopped. All the soldiers took shelter as best they could, some in hastily dug trenches, others behind vehicles. Beside me, I put a few magazines to have on hand. They will probably be enough for two hours of fighting, I thought. And then... There was no use worrying about what would come after that. Not a single shot was fired for half an hour. Absolute silence. Our nerves were strained to the limit. Sooner something would start, sooner they would attack. But nothing happened. Another hour of languid waiting passed, and morning came. Enough light for target practice, Cal remarked, smoking his pipe carefully. Squinting to see better, I stared intently into the distance at the wide strip of highway. Oh, my God! It can't be. Out of breath, I rushed to our commander's hideout. On the approach from the West, German motorcyclists, I reported, hardly able to catch my breath. Glancing at me, the commander raised his binoculars. Follow me, he shouted, and we jumped on the motorcycle and raced along the chain of stunned soldiers. A fat and unflappable Wehrmacht major clumsily climbed out of the motorcycle sidecar. His face broke into a broad smile. It's hilarious, he said. In the last village they told us that they heard shooting here all night. But I see that everything is quiet. Very calm, replied our colonel, coughing in a strange, muffled voice. I have only forty men killed. But, he continued, the enemy appears to have retreated. Soon we were back in our cars and headed further east. Follow me, he shouted and we jumped on the motorcycle and raced along the chain of stunned soldiers. A fat and unflappable Wehrmacht major clumsily climbed out of the motorcycle sidecar. 
His face broke into a broad smile. It's hilarious, he said. In the last village they told us that they heard shooting here all night. But I see that everything is quiet. Very calm, replied our colonel, coughing in a strange muffled voice. I have only forty men killed. But, he continued, the enemy appears to have retreated. Soon we were back in the cars and rolling further east. Gradually clouds covered the sky and a light rain fell. After a sleepless night, the exhausted and wet soldiers sat in the trucks, hunched over and shivering from the damp. From the sky came the noise of an airplane engine. Was it an enemy airplane? From above flew aerial bombs tearing to the right of the road. But they were German bombs. In this weather, the Luftwaffe pilots mistook us for retreating Russians. The soldiers jumped up from their seats, waving their arms frantically. A few more bombs whistled, but no one was in a hurry to take cover. On the contrary, everyone was shouting, cursing, gesticulating. Finally, the pilot realised who he had bombed, and he, probably ashamed, soared sharply upwards and disappeared. This episode ended without loss of life, but nevertheless it did not allow us to respect the German Air Force. At noon, we found that the narrow country road we had been following led us straight to our objective, the Northern Highway. Now we were already following the armoured vehicles of the advance battalion of the division, a sure sign of events to come. Meanwhile, we kept driving and driving. At times we heard shots of single snipers, but no one thought of stopping. Time was too precious. Everyone already knew our main task. The tanks of von Kleist's first tank group stopped a few kilometres from Kiev, having no fuel and having only meagre remnants of food and ammunition. The Russians had already closed the ring, and our armoured vehicles were trapped. It was impossible for transports with fuel and other necessary materials to reach them. The enemy held the main highway in his hands. We had to unblock it and allow the Wehrmacht tank units to regain their breath. Therefore, we strove relentlessly forward. At four o'clock in the morning we crossed the old Soviet border until September 17th, 1939, Eddy. Later that morning we were subjected to the first enemy air raids, each time 30 to 40 planes. Our losses, two killed and several wounded. Towards sunset near the village of Romanovka, we engaged in a fierce battle with the stubbornly resisting enemy and finally forced him to retreat. I personally did not take part in this battle. That same evening we stopped at a large collective farm. A large part of the cattle belonging to the collective farm had been shot by the retreating Soviet troops. And here for the first time I had the opportunity to talk to a man of German nationality who lived outside the German Reich. Are any of you from the Palatinate? asked the young woman who was serving us milk and honey. Unfortunately, there was no one from those places among us. According to the woman, her ancestors moved here from Rhineland Palatinate. We asked the woman about her living conditions. Living conditions? she asked tiredly. Until 1928, we were making ends meet. And then, my father was shot. He was against collective farms. Maybe he should have thought more about his family, but he kept repeating, we paid for our plot of land with money and our own sweat, and no one has the right to take it away from us. He was shot as a saboteur and counter-revolutionary. Both of my brothers were sentenced to ten years, and we have known nothing about them ever since. True, Georg, the youngest, wrote once from Irkutsk, but not a word since. My mother lost her mind and hanged herself. My husband Hans was mobilised a month ago to dig trenches, I would like to know if I will ever see him again. I don't believe it. And now I was left alone with three children. Three small children, two girls and a boy, were timidly clinging to their mother's skirt. We looked at each other in utter bewilderment. We were most struck by the fact that the woman spoke of her troubles as if they were commonplace, as if she were telling us the usual village news. Then an old Ukrainian man spoke. He had been a prisoner of war in Austria during World War I and spoke a little German. You must not think that only Volksdeutsche have suffered, he said in broken German. 
I was sentenced to five years in prison for being late for work twice. I didn't have a watch, and I lived far away from the collective farm. And my brother was shot. His tone was just as casual, almost indifferent. But you talk about it as if you were discussing the weather or the harvest. I couldn't help myself. You talk about terrible things, as if... Do you know what it is to live constantly near death? The old man smiled bitterly. Nothing is as scary as it seems at first glance. We didn't answer anything. The conversation ended there, and the next morning we were on the road again, through vast forests, fertile fields, long swamps, deeper and deeper into these vast expanses of a foreign country. Destroyed bridges forced us to look for detours, but we kept strictly to the course we had taken. Finally, on July 11th, we reached our goal, a wide, well-maintained road. The forward companies deployed in battle order along it, taking up positions among the bushes and small hills. The assault guns were spread out in front. About nine o'clock, a German non-commissioned officer came out on the road without a cap and belt, but with a parabellum in his hand. Wiping the blood from his face, he reported the following. The motorcycle battalion of the Wehrmacht has been surrounded for three days in the village of Sokolovo, two kilometres north of the main road. A non-commissioned officer was sent from there to call for backup, and he crawled all night through the Soviet troop locations. Toward the end he was still spotted and shelled, but he miraculously managed to survive and make his way to his own. A few minutes later, the assault guns with the troopers on armour were already rolling towards Sokolov. Soon, an enemy anti-tank gun opened fire. The first shot set fire to the lead self-propelled gun, which burst into bright flames. The second assault gun was luckier and managed to destroy the anti-tank gun. At the entrance to the village, we came under intense enemy fire. The infantry, jumping off the armour, immediately took up a position in the roadside ditch. Huddled on the ground, I looked in the direction from which the firing was conducted. The assault guns were firing indiscriminately. Suddenly, I saw a head in the attic window of the house opposite, and met my eyes with a Russian soldier setting up a machine gun to fire at a chain of German soldiers lying in a shallow depression 30 metres behind me. I raised my rifle and took aim. It was no more than 10 metres to the house. As soon as the Russian soldier raised the machine gun, I pulled the trigger and saw blood trickling from his forehead. I lay motionless on the spot, unable to move. The soldiers around me rose from their hiding places and rushed across the street to the house across the street. Are you OK? One of them shouted, running past me and shoving me. I stood up, my whole body shaking and wiping the cold sweat from my forehead, my knees buckling. I had just killed a man, and for the first time, so coldly and deliberately. The next few minutes seemed like a dream. I saw myself running with the others down a village street. A self-propelled vehicle rolled by on the right, firing its guns and machine guns. Then I looked into the glowing joy of sweaty, grimy faces, dozens of hands reaching for me. A slender, elegant officer in an immaculate uniform standing out sharply from his surroundings tugged me into cover. I killed a man, I said with difficulty, and then I pulled myself together. The elderly colonel, a representative man in his fifties, looked at me intently and smiling said, Keep it up, son. You've got a long time to live. I stayed close to him. He raised his rifle and began firing at the dark figures running across the clearing opposite. I followed his example and heard him say, You guys did a great job. We're almost done. I will always remember your division and the help you gave us. Meanwhile, the commander of the assault guns, having assessed the situation, called for reinforcements by radio. Soon a whole company of self-propelled artillery units arrived in Sokolovo. The Russians withdrew without waiting for our attack. Have you had breakfast? The colonel suddenly asked me. If not, be my guest. Literally dismayed by the unexpected invitation, I tried to make my mud-stained military uniform look more or less respectable. The soldier placed white paper napkins in front of the colonel, his adjutant, a fat major, and me, poured beef broth soup on white plates, 
then served meat and vegetables. The whole thing was like a fairy tale. During the meal, the colonel was constantly receiving reports from the regiment's units and giving orders. After finishing my meal, I stood up and asked permission to return to my soldiers, who were still lying in a flat notch some hundred yards away. Turning, I looked in the direction we had come from that morning and saw several dozen steel helmets towering above the ears at the edge of a wheat field next to a narrow dirt road. We have the Ivans in the rear, I reported hastily. These must be your reinforcements, the colonel smiled sceptically. Our helmet covers don't shine in the sun, I objected, taking a closer look. Instantly becoming serious, the colonel shouted, Sapper company, vehicle drivers, liaisons, clerks, cooks, to me, the Russians are behind us. The men ran from everywhere, from the headquarters, from various shelters, and immediately got into line. At that moment, the Russians, numbering up to a company, went on the attack. Together with everyone else, I fired, without aiming, from a machine gun at the wheat field. The return machine gun fire forced us to lie down. As I fired magazine after magazine, I noticed a shadow falling over me. When I looked back, I saw a lieutenant colonel in white leather gloves with a pistol at his belt standing three steps away from me. To the right, boys, to the right, and aim better. Silence that machine gun, Franz, he said to the machine gunner. Give me a few low bursts. Seeing this, I got up too, but I must admit I was not very hasty. Now I could see something. In a moment, all our soldiers stood up and rushed to the counter-attack. The Russians ran right under the rifle and machine gun fire of the reinforcements coming to our aid. Meanwhile, all the units of our battalion joined us. A German airborne artillery fire adjuster began to circle over our heads. At last, the artillery would support us. But before we knew it, enemy shells began to burst around us. Especially the command post was hit, and again the German correcting airplane circled over us, and again a hail of shells fell on us with unusual accuracy. There was confusion among the soldiers, and 280mm heavy guns were already firing. The ground beneath our feet shook and shuddered. God damn it! That's a Russian flying! Karl, who was standing next to me, shouted, pointing at the plane. As if to confirm his words, enemy shells again rained down on us with devastating accuracy. The orderlies did not have time to carry away the wounded. The command post was moved to another place, and we scattered among the village buildings. There was a lively exchange of radiograms between the battalion and the division. Finally, permission was received to open fire on the German plane, and when it reappeared, it was in a dense ring of bursts. The plane gained altitude and continued to circle above us, and again for the umpteenth time, our positions were covered by an enemy artillery salvo. Then the airplane disappeared. Probably a light German airplane F-156 Storch once fell into the hands of the enemy and was now used against us having retained all the identification marks of the Luftwaffe. By evening, the enemy was defeated and pushed back to the Rokitnyansky marshes. As if to counterbalance this victory, the division then had to fight fierce defensive battles for three days on a stretch of six kilometres along the main highway. During this period, there was a rumour that Budeni intended to strike a crushing blow on our right flank. Although the enemy had a significant numerical superiority and continuously pulled up reserves, our division, despite heavy losses, steadfastly repelled all attacks and even slightly expanded the occupied territory. Eventually we were given one day's rest in the village of Motishin. Here for the first time I met Ukrainian industrial workers employed in the pottery workshops in the neighbourhood. I was extremely curious to talk to the people, representatives of the hegemonic class in the workers' paradise, especially since one of them, a Pole by nationality, spoke German. How do we live? He repeated my question. It is not difficult to describe. We earn about 400 rubles a month. A pair of boots costs 500 to 600 rubles. A suit at least 600 rubles. A loaf of bread costs 9 rubles. A kilogram of meat 15 rubles. But it's impossible to live like that, I remarked. 
It doesn't bother them, shrugged the Pole. The director gets 3,000, of course, and the engineers at least 1,500. I began to wonder if I had misheard. And not only that, the Pole continued, our stores differ in prices and the range of goods from those used by engineers, directors and party members. The ordinary worker cannot buy wherever he wants, but only in the store of the consumer cooperative to which he is attached, and he cannot buy at will, and much he can buy only by distribution. The NKVD officers, Red Army commanders and party workers have their own closed stores, an old German immigrant woman said, squeezing her way through the crowd around me. We don't even know what they get there, but they all look well-fed and well-dressed. It's different here. Let's say you want to buy a coat for 400 rubles, green and size 46, but the salesman sends you a red one in size 50. Whether you take it or not is up to you. There are no others. To tell the truth, we are happy to wear anything at all, and we have been saving money for a whole year. But you have a proletarian democracy, don't you? I objected. Why don't you do something during the elections? In response to my words, first there was silence, then there was friendly laughter. The voting list, the Pole explained, wiping away the tears rolling down his cheeks, was always headed by Joseph Stalin and Molotov, followed by Zdanov, Beria and the rest of the Central Committee. Then came the local candidates from the Communists and the bloc of non-partisans. All, on one ballot, the only one allowed to vote. This was the order established by the Electoral Law of 1936. There were no other lists, and not voting at all meant asking for trouble. So if you valued your life and freedom, you went and voted with everyone else. This is the so-called proletarian democracy. Those present continued to describe the mechanism of the system's functioning. The freely elected deputies represented 16 from 1940 to 1956. There was also the Karelian Finnish SSR. Ed. Soviet republics, about 650 paid sycophants sat in the Supreme Soviet, and about 650 more in the Council of Nationalities. Dozens of ministers and members of the government were mere departmental officials. All decisions were made by a narrow circle of Politburo members and the Central Committee of the ruling Communist Party since 1917. It was they who determined the fate of the 200 million. On September 1, 1940, the population of the USSR was 191.7 million. By the beginning of the war, about 195 million. Eddie population. And the above-mentioned members were appointed to these posts not by the millions of citizens they governed, and not even by the six million party members, but by the top of the party, and above all by Joseph Stalin. It was a dictatorship like no new history has ever known. And Tsars, such as Napoleon, were, if we compare their regimes to this dictatorship, we might say, infants. Stalin and his men realised what many dictators and emperors only dreamed of. The top of the party determined the order of behaviour and conditions of existence of people, controlled their thoughts and actions, unceremoniously intruded into family relations, indiscriminately ruled over the life and death of its citizens. And Stalin was a truly omnipotent dictator. This is the essence of what is called proletarian democracy abroad said the old German woman. Your own questions, the questions of a German soldier, show how widespread this misconception is. But in Russia itself it has come to the point that people, starving and begging, do not grumble, believing that it cannot be otherwise. They cherish their fetters, having known nothing else. This was the end of the conversation. The order to march was received. That evening we stopped in a fairly large village, as soon as the locals noticed that I was trying to establish contact with them, hundreds of men and women surrounded me. An intelligent-looking young man grabbed my sleeve. For many years we Ukrainians have been suffering and dying, he said. Now we can get even. We don't need anything from you Germans. We are ready for anything. Give us only rifles and ammunition. An intelligent-looking young man grabbed my sleeve. 
For many years we Ukrainians have been suffering and dying, he said. Now we can get even. We don't need anything from you Germans. We are ready for anything. Just give us rifles and ammunition. Worried, the young man said the last words in Ukrainian, and the crowd instantly and amicably picked up. Cannon! Guns! I am only a common soldier, I replied, deeply touched by the expression of sincere feeling. But I fervently hope that your wish will be granted. You see, sir, continued the young man, my father was an old Bolshevik, exiled to Siberia by the Tsar. He believed in the ideals of liberty, equality and fraternity. Later, my father fought in the partisans, and we were very proud of him. But when, at the factory, he spoke out against senseless terror and class preferences in the distribution of food and manufactured goods, he disappeared without a trace, and we have not seen him since. The same fate befell almost all members of the old party guard. They were labelled Trotskyists, saboteurs and traitors. And these were people who had shed their blood for the revolution. Incomparably more blood was shed by people who opposed the revolution, as well as members of their families and simply innocent, but class alien, Ed. In the whole of Ukraine, there were no more than a dozen of them left alive. The rest were branded enemies of the people and shot or tortured in prisons and camps. The All-Union Communist Party of Bolsheviks gave us freedom. Freedom to die or to submit. It brought us equality. Equality with clear class distinctions, more severe than in the worst capitalist system. A non-partisan cannot get a privileged card for food and general merchandise, and without it, it is impossible to make ends meet. They also gave us brotherhood. Brotherhood with commissars and a bullet in the back. Upon hearing the word commissioner, the crowd seemed to go wild. Commissar, howled the old invalid, pointing to his mangled back. Commissioner, shouted the young woman, pointing to the missing eye. Two girls carried a middle-aged woman to us on a primitive stretcher. She clasped my hand in her thin, skinny fingers and insistently whispered over and over again words I couldn't understand. This is the wife of our village priest, the young man explained sympathetically. When the Red Army went to the front, the commissars rounded up all the unreliable villagers and shot them. The woman on the stretcher kept her gaze on me. Among them were our priest and his two sons. The youngest was eight years old. From the shock she fell into unconsciousness and was shattered by paralysis. Now she wants you Germans to avenge her children a thousandfold. Cannon! Cannon! The crowd roared again, men and women, all together. Excited by the strength of the feelings they showed, I shook the many hands extended to me and departed. Chapter 2 South We drove all night long, this time heading south. The infantry units had already made a forced march to the nearest approaches to Kiev. We passed still smoking Zhitomir. The enemy resisted fiercely with all available means, and for the next few days his artillery and aviation turned our life into a continuous hell. On one of these days, in the course of the battle, I realised another side of my nature, hitherto unknown to me. At that moment the enemy bombs were again tearing through our orders with terrible accuracy, and fountains of earth were rising up to the sky beside me. Amid the metallic howl of shrapnel flying overhead, I suddenly heard a pleading call. Give me a personalised bag! Automatically I slipped my hand into my pocket. The last one. We had been dressing wounds all day, and although I had thoughtfully grabbed three packets this morning, I had already used up all but one. I hesitated. What if I needed bandaging myself? But then I pulled myself together, crawled over to the wounded soldier and gave him the packet. Ashamed of my momentary weakness, I couldn't look him in the face. One by one, in quick succession, we occupied the settlements of Medovadu and Zipanonovka. At the latter I learned that Maxamon, with whom we had enlisted together, had been killed, the first from my old unit. At Zipanonovka we truly realised with what fierceness on both sides this war in the east was being fought. 
we were forced to temporarily abandon this settlement, and when we retook it, we found the graves of our soldiers ravaged and desecrated. Continuing the offensive, we cleared Novo Arkhangelsk of enemy troops. The enemy entrenched on the surrounding hills and desperately resisted, apparently determined at all costs to hold their positions as the basis of the entire defensive line. We were particularly harassed by a battery of light howitzers positioned behind a low fold in a gentle hollow a few hundred yards from our forward positions. Refusing to withdraw, it was firing heavily on our advancing infantry, inflicting heavy damage. The commander of the 6th anti-aircraft battery attached to us, quickly assessing the situation, moved one of his guns, in the soldier's jargon, Anton, into the infantry's fighting order, and a thrilling duel between the faithful Anton and the Russian battery began. Shell after shell flew out with rumbling and howling from the glowing barrels. Seeing our field officer standing on the shell box and correcting the fire of the Anton with binoculars in his hands, the Soviet battery commander also began to direct the fire standing up, walking back and forth and not paying attention to the shrapnel falling around him. The first shell of the Anton, Underfleet, the second, Overfleet. It was not so easy to hit the target in the lowlands. We were terribly worried about our anti-aircraft gun, surrounded by soaring fountains of explosions. The third shell fell closer to the target, and the fourth must have covered the battery. It fell silent, but soon resumed firing with redoubled force. Then the shell of the Anton hit right in the centre of the hollow. Mangled pieces of cannon and human bodies soared into the sky. The Soviet commander had completed his fight for world revolution. The German infantry went on the offensive and already in the evening had gained a foothold on the hills. When I returned to the village, night had fallen on the sunflower fields and only the tapping of telegraph keys broke the primordial silence. On both our flanks we had no contact with other German units and divisions. No sooner had I gone to bed and covered myself with a blanket than I heard the duty officer call, Liaison. I was to go to the 17th Company and give it the order to move back 500 metres, to prevent the Russians from infiltrating through the unprotected space between the companies. We rode the motorcycle without lights, and every now and then we bumped into shell craters left over from the last battle of the day before. Soon the driver stopped and stated, The 17th is right in front of us. Unfortunately, the liaison of the 17th Company had been wounded at noon, and I did not know the whereabouts of the other companies except my own so I went straight forward, staggering with fatigue and stumbling over furrows and dead Russians. Sometimes I fell down and, getting up, tried to stick to the direction I had taken. I wanted to smoke, but caution prevailed, and I put the cigarette back in my pocket. There was dead silence, but a sixth sense told me that something might happen at any moment, and it happened. Suddenly I realised that I was lost, and for a moment I panicked, I had been wandering in pitch darkness for at least half an hour, and I still hadn't heard any of sound. A few bursts echoed from far to the left, but all around me was silent. I lay flat and pressed my ear to the ground. As a child, I had read that the ground conducts sound better than air. But the ground was silent, and then, standing up, I clearly realised that I had completely and utterly lost my bearings. Suddenly I caught a sound and began to listen intensely peering into the darkness. The sound repeated itself more clearly. A group of people were coming in my direction. I was heading towards them and was about to call out to them when I heard, No, we need to go to the right. I froze in horror and then quietly took cover in the nearest hollow. It was probably a Russian reconnaissance patrol probing the German defences. As they approached, I heard the clinking of weapons, their boots crunched on either side, only a few steps from my hiding place. My heart was pounding furiously in my chest, and I was afraid. I wondered if the enemy would hear it pounding. I only then realised that the patrol had passed by when the command to the right was heard. I rose with an effort and sneakily followed them. Apparently the patrol consisted of no more than a dozen people. Minutes passed, but everything remained quiet. Stop. Who's coming? 
Suddenly, someone asked in German. Watch out! There are Russians here! I shouted, falling down and firing a long automatic rifle line. Almost at the same time, the machine gun opened fire with me. Almost the entire Russian reconnaissance patrol was destroyed. Only a few Russians, taking advantage of the darkness, managed to escape. And I finally found the 17th Company. Cleansit.ru advertisement. Cleansit C against acne. Helps relieve inflammation, inhibits the growth of bacteria. Cleansit C gel for the treatment of acne and pimples. Cleansit C gel relieves inflammation. Cleansit C gel inhibits bacteria. Cleansit C gel. Substances. Adapalene. Plus clindamycin. Gel. Cleansit C for the treatment of problem skin. Read more on the site. Cleansit C against acne. Helps relieve inflammation. Inhibits the growth of bacteria. Learn more. 12. Related books on Dance of Death. We present to you similar books on Dance of Death, with the list of books to choose from. We have selected similar literature by title and meaning, in the hope of providing readers with more options to find new and interesting works not yet read. Libclub.ru, book without cover Libclub.ru, book without cover Ludwig Kern. Once upon a time Ali Erich Kern, Dance of Death, Memories of SS Untersturmführer. 1941-1945, The Dance of Death, Memories of an SS Untersturmführer. 1941-1945, Erich Kern, Dance of Death, Memories of an SS Untersturmführer. 1914-1945, Anna Kern, A Diary for Rest Anna, Kern's Diary for Rest, Diary for Rest, Lipclub.ru, Book Without Cover Lipclub.ru, Book Without Cover Kiprian, Kern Anthropology of St. Gregory Palamas, Lipclub.ru. Book Without Cover Lib Club, Dot Ru, Book Without Cover Kiprian, Kern Liturgics, Lada Fomina, Anna Kern, The Muse of Alexander Pushkin, Anna Kern, The Muse of Alexander Pushkin, Lada Fomina, Anna Kern, A.S. Pushkin's Muse, Reviews of the Book Dance of Death, Discussion Reviews of the Book The Dance of Death, and Just Readers' Own Opinions. Leave your comments, write what you think about the work, its meaning, or the main characters. Indicate what exactly liked and what not, and why you think so. Watch out! There are Russians here! I shouted, falling down and firing a long machine gun burst. Almost at the same time, the machine gun opened fire with me. Almost the entire Russian reconnaissance patrol was destroyed. Only a few Russians, taking advantage of the darkness, managed to escape. And I finally found the 17th Company. The next morning the fighting continued and success was invariably on our side. By noon the Russian resistance had increased. We struck through Olgopol and captured Pulakivka, where we found a huge Soviet tank abandoned by the crew for lack of fuel. Opening the turret hatch, we looked inside. There was still ammunition. There was also a voluminous book, Karl Marx's Capital. I turned the pages of the grandiose work leisurely. For many years, the theory of surplus value has brought death and destruction to the peoples of the world. Strikes, long prison sentences, and death sentences are the direct consequences of this Pseuto teaching. In a few decades, it has managed to destroy hundreds of thousands of human lives, even more driven out of their homes, and brought the whole world a lot of misery and misery. In its stronghold, Russia, the world's largest laboratory, this doctrine has turned people individually and collectively, into guinea pigs, condemning millions to death. We were often surprised by the almost inhuman tenacity with which the Red Army fought, the incredible resilience of even very young Komsomol members, in fact 15-year-old teenagers who, without sparing their own lives, defended their positions, firing points, combat vehicles. But once a prisoner from the Caucasus revealed a secret, as soon as the situation on any section of the front became absolutely hopeless, he said, the commissars, under some plausible pretext, left the pillboxes and tanks and went to new defensive lines. The ingenuous and gullible Soviet soldiers, such as the Siberians who were left inside, were indoctrinated all their lives. That all Europeans were fascists and capitalists who killed prisoners of war with horrible tortures. 
Therefore, the unfortunates continued to fight with the desperation of the doomed until their last breath. The next evening I met with Cowell again. By that time there was a relative calm at the front. I told him about what I had seen in the Ukrainian village. It's just a matter of being able to use them properly, Cowell said, sighing. You don't think we're going to ignore them, do you? I looked at him in surprise. All these people are on the verge of exploding with outrage. Do you really think we're going to pretend like none of this is happening? You're forgetting one thing, my friend, Carl smiled faintly. We're the ones who have bound ourselves. And then there's the little matter of giving them rights and status that we've already denied them beforehand. But Carl, I objected, you're turning into a cynic. Your service in a concentration camp has had a profound effect on you. It's not about doctrine, good or bad, right or wrong. I haven't thought about it. It's not ideology that matters now. It is simply a question of life, ordinary life and death. Absolutely everything is at stake. The future of Germany and the fate of the rest of the world. And not least the fate of those unfortunate people who, after going through hell, have greeted us enthusiastically and expect freedom and equality from us. OK, OK, Cowell interrupted my tirade. Let's wait and see what prevails. Party doctrine or common sense? I parted from Cowell unhappy with myself. The man had a rare ability to spoil the mood, and I was scared. What if he was right? Feeling very tired and downcast, I spread out my blanket. The next morning the fierce fighting and attacks resumed. All day long we advanced rapidly. I did not notice that dusk was approaching. The setting sun was still illuminating the ridge of hills where the Russians had placed the mortar battery. But the evening shadow was already creeping over the village, which had been left without a shot fired by the enemy only two hours before. A small mud-brick hut by the road looked like a suitable place for a short rest. We knocked, and a slim figure of a Ukrainian girl with a mop of brown hair appeared in the narrow doorway. Yes, we have the place, she said, answering our question. We went into the house. As usual, the only room, the upper room, served as both kitchen and bedroom. We brought straw from the nearest stack. Two small children followed our every move. The girl, still a teenager of sixteen, no longer a child but not yet a woman, smiled when she saw us covering the straw with blankets and lying down on the floor without undressing. Where is your father? I asked the girl. Shot. For what? I don't know. And your mum? Died. Last year. But what do you eat? You and two small children? Seeds. She laughed, showing her white teeth and nodding at the impressive pile of seeds roasting on the stove. We had been relentlessly pursuing the enemy all the previous day, and I did not awake until late at night. Had none of us been on guard duty, or had we been forgotten? From the village street I could hear the Mishud footsteps of a patrol passing by. Somewhere in the distance a wounded cow mooed pitifully, and occasionally a single shot echoed. Otherwise nothing disturbed the silence of the night. In the flickering light of the kerosene lamp on the table, I could make out a teenage girl lying on her narrow bed. The blanket had slipped to the floor, and in the dim light the fragile silhouette of a girl was indistinct. Trying not to make any noise, I cautiously approached the girl's bed and gently covered her with the blanket. She woke up, startled. Don't be afraid, I said quietly, trying to reassure her. What's your name? It turned out that her name was Tekle, a rather unusual name for a Ukrainian woman and more typical of women from Lithuania or Latvia. But to all appearances, she was a rather unconventional person in general, who did not run away, but deliberately took on all the burdens and worries of an absent mother. Tomorrow, Tekle, I smiled encouragingly, you must tell me your story. All right, tomorrow she answered obediently, and the delicate colour spread from her thin neck all over her face. But a soldier's fate is inexorable. At dawn we attacked, and after a fierce fight we knocked the enemy out of his position on the hills, driving him back to the town, 
whose towers and factory chimneys could be seen in the misty distance. The alarm sounded suddenly. We barely had time to gather our things, and not even time to eat. I wanted to explain to Tekle, but there was a sharp command from the company officer, and I ran outside. For a moment Tekle froze in the doorway as if paralysed, and then rushed into the house. She caught up with us on the way out of the village, and slipped something into the pocket of my uniform. I had just time to shake the girl's hand when the Russian machine guns started firing. Something unimaginable was happening. The air was thickly saturated with metal, and our heads seemed too big. As I was crawling and changing firing positions, I kept feeling something in my right side. My hand fumbled for seeds. I immediately threw the first seed into my mouth with pleasure. What do you have there? My neighbour asked. I handed him a handful of seeds. Surprised at first, he chewed them with pleasure. The others also wanted some seeds, and my pocket was soon empty. Meanwhile, the battle was getting hotter and hotter, and low over our heads the shrapnel was shrieking and howling, sowing destruction and death. In the evening we entered the city, and in a short time were asleep in the dead of night. The next day bad news came one after another from the companies. The sapper company was attacked from the flank of the woods, and only the vigorous action of two anti-aircraft batteries helped to save the situation and repel the attack. The 16th, 18th, and, to a lesser extent, the 17th. Companies could hardly hold off the massive pressure of the enemy. Soon a distress call came over the radio from there. We're running out of ammunition. Send shells and ammunition of all calibres immediately, otherwise we will be forced to withdraw. To top it all off, it had been pouring rain since morning, the roads were washed away, and they were drowned in impenetrable mud in which the trucks were stuck. With feverish speed we loaded ammunition on a tracked artillery tractor. Only it could overcome the impassable mire. Then the commander, addressing me, said, You know the way. Take two men with you and go ahead. Ammunition must be delivered on time. At the highest possible speed we set off. A fierce battle was raging on both sides of use, but we had no time to go into details. We had to get the ammunition to the target at all costs. We reached the hill where the fierce fighting had taken place the day before and turned toward a small dilapidated bridge advancing through a narrow valley that sheltered us from the enemy's fire. The driver glanced anxiously at the impenetrable mud on which we were almost floating. But the car passed safely over the danger and came to the stretch of road we had just occupied. Across the open field an unfamiliar soldier was running toward us. You want 16th Company? God knows where it is now. In any case, it is not here. Everyone has gone ahead. At the top of the hill, something howled over the cab of a tractor trailer, which made a great target. What if an anti-tank gun started firing? It was as if the driver had read my mind. Ammunition, he whispered. If they are lost... All fears for his own life vanished. The shells and ammunition had to be delivered to the site. Take us with you! Two German wounded lying in the grass by the roadside were begging. Don't leave us here. But the ammunition had to be delivered to the site. I can't, I shouted, avoiding the stares of the unfortunates. But we'll be back for sure. Far ahead on the right, we noticed several human figures in the field. Ours or not. They turned out to be the ones I was looking for though not from the 16th, but from the 18th Company. I reported my arrival to the lieutenant who had taken command. You're just in time, he said. Start unloading. I need to take the high ground first, then I'll get the ammunition. Barely dragging their feet through the tall wheat, twenty or thirty prisoners of war came up, and in a few minutes the boxes of cartridges and shells were neatly stacked and carefully covered with straw for camouflage. The prisoners of war, drooping and miserable, huddled together, squatting in a roadside ditch. Low over our heads, two Russian airplanes, a rare sight in those days, howled, firing all kinds of airborne weapons but mostly missing the target. 
The vast field around was strewn with the bodies of Red Army soldiers. I went to the place where, according to my assumptions, was the 16th Company. With me went some non-commissioned officer who vaguely imagined the location of the 16th Company. Suddenly I froze like a halt. One of the Russian dead moved. Don't worry, the non-commissioned officer muttered, pulling his pistol from his holster. In the blink of an eye, the dead man jumped up and swung the grenade, but a pistol shot beat him to it. We looked with disbelief at the other corpses of the enemy, lying in heaps and alone. Death had worked hard here. All too often we had to see how these victims of the Kremlin, as if mesmerised by the rattle of German machine guns, with glazed eyes, died in masses under the hail of our bullets. The expression of their faces did not change even near death. With inexorable persistence they attacked again and again, and this fanaticism of the enemy, characteristic of the Eastern Front, was particularly frightening. Eventually I found the 16th Company and pointed out where we were storing ammunition. I also informed the commander of the 17th Company. Then we set off on our way back through a valley densely riddled with craters from enemy shells. At the battalion's command post there was joyous excitement. Reports of successes were coming in from all sides. Reading the radiograms, the battalion commander allowed himself to smile for the first time all day. As dusk fell, our companies regained their positions, taking the town of Uman in a ring. The evening sky was ablaze with the glow of fires and artillery flashes. My company, perched on a steep riverbank, had an excellent position for firing, but no movement was visible on the opposite side. The prisoners taken during the day, a lieutenant and sixty soldiers sat huddled in a shallow hollow behind our trenches. A messenger soon sought me out and said, The company commander ordered you to take the POWs to the rear. Take someone else with you to help you. With difficulty I got up, beckoned Rudy to me, and organised the prisoners. The lieutenant and I led the column, followed by Rudy with his automatic rifle in his hand. We walked westward toward the fading evening dawn, past the dead and wounded scattered across the field. Occasionally we came across orderlies with stretchers, but soon it was all behind us, and we found ourselves alone in the quickening darkness of night. What if the Russians should suddenly think of attacking us? flashed through my mind. The two of us can't stand against sixty. Next to me a Russian lieutenant waddled, stumbling. Would you like a cigarette? I asked, and he nodded silently. I handed the lieutenant a pack of cigarettes, and by the light of a match I stared intensely into his impassive face, bitterly regretting my ignorance of the Russian language. What thoughts were wandering in the lieutenant's brain? I could hear Rudy scolding at the end of the column. Every now and then someone would get out of line. We had been marching alone in the night darkness for more than an hour, and I was getting more and more anxious to meet the rear guard. I had not realised that the battalion command post was so far away. Suddenly there was indiscriminate firing on our left, and I stopped in alarm. The prisoners huddled around me like frightened sheep. Stop shooting, you idiots, I shouted. There's a convoy of prisoners of war here. But the firefight only intensified, and soon machine gun bursts were heard. Commander! Rudy shouted, running up to me. It's the Ivans! And he wasn't wrong. The Russians had apparently broken through our positions somewhere and were trying to make their way to the road on which we were moving. Bullets whistled over my head. Instinctively, I threw myself flat on the ground and began to crawl toward the roadside ditch, at the same time taking my gun out of its holster. One of them is going to lunge at me, I thought, but nothing of the sort happened. I could hear the heavy intermittent breathing of the lieutenant following me. Judging from the noise of the battle, the Russians were not more than 200 metres from us. When I looked back, I saw that the prisoners were crawling after us in a friendly manner. Their faces were frozen, lifeless masks. Suddenly I felt sure and safe. My fears and doubts vanished. From time to time I heard the shouts of the attacking Russians. My prisoners did not make a sound, but crawled obediently after me pressing their breasts against the Ukrainian soil. But now the road descended into a deep ravine, 
and I rose to my feet with a sigh of relief. From the opposite side came the battle cry of counter-attacking German infantry. They had arrived just in time. In pitch darkness, we arrived at the battalion command post where, to my great displeasure, I received orders to take the prisoners farther to the rear and hand them over to the military police. So we continued on our way, tired and exhausted to the extreme, and finally arrived at the prisoner of war camp. The fat field sergeant who received the column gave a heavy kick to one of the prisoners who had hesitated to obey a command. Take your time. I stopped him. Those poor fellows could do us both in no time. And I told the lieutenant what we had been through, but there was no sympathy in his eyes. Then I gave the prisoners all my tobacco, and Rudy did the same. And there was nothing more I, a junior commander, could do for them. Two and a half years later, in March 1944, in almost the same places, taken prisoners in the course of fighting, Germans went unaccompanied by the hundreds, Bereznegivato, Snegerevskaya, and other operations. Ed. Do you know, Rudy began as we returned to the front line, I was about to use my machine gun. I thought that if we were going to die, we should take someone else with us. But you are right. The way you did it was better. I said nothing. This 19-year-old had recently arrived at the front. He would not have understood me if I had tried to explain anything to him. At that time, I did not quite understand what was going on in the heads of the prisoners of war, why they behaved this way and not the other. After all, there were their own there, there was freedom and the possibility of joining their units, but here, just two German soldiers. In the summer of 1941, many Red Army soldiers, surrendering as prisoners of war, still harboured certain illusions, not realising that this was a war of annihilation primarily of the Russian people, clearing living space for the Germans. Ed. Why didn't they run? We couldn't have stopped them, and we wouldn't have even tried. In our position, we would have been glad to be alive ourselves. However, such strange behaviour of the captives was explained quite simply. The Soviet authorities considered all Red Army soldiers who had been held captive to be politically unreliable elements. After all, even a brief contact with the enemy, even a fleeting glance on the other side of the Iron Curtain could open their eyes, help them to distinguish truth from lies. And this is already dangerous. So, a court-martial, prison or firing squad. The interrogations could go on for many days, almost indefinitely. What was the appeal? What were the Germans interested in, and what did they interrogate about? What was your impression of them? And woe to the poor man, whose answers aroused distrust or seemed suspicious. If he, terrified of arrest, in his confusion, allowed a careless word to be spoken, imminent death awaited him. No matter how deeply the beastly hatred of the enemy, constantly inculcated by the commissars, penetrated into the consciousness of a Red Army soldier, he, who had once found himself alive in captivity by the will of fate, dreaded more than anything else the prospect of being captured again. The very fact that he had returned unhurt and not physically broken but in full health would serve as a clear testimony to the falsity of the anti-German propaganda of the Bolsheviks. Consequently, it was necessary to stigmatise such a soldier with the definition of traitor. Only a traitor could return from captivity unharmed. In the morning, at dawn, the enemy opened a hurricane fire. The shells were bursting a hundred metres to our right in the location of the neighbouring battalion where the Russians had tried to break through the night before. This time the first to storm our positions were the Russian tanks with machine gunners on their armour, followed directly by cavalry, then artillery on horseback and infantry. The enemy rolled wave after wave. Two batteries of 88mm guns were transferred to help the defenders, who opened fire on the attackers with direct fire. Continuously our machine guns were raining down, our tanks were burning, people and horses were falling down. Wide-eyed we watched from the trenches, the spectacle unfolding before our eyes, as if we were spectators of some unknown theatre. In an hour everything was over, 
the attempt to break out of the encirclement failed. The ring around the Uman cauldron continued to shrink. Southeast of Uman in the encirclement were parts of the 6th and 12th Soviet armies, in total about 100,000 people. Ed. Around noon we were replaced by an infantry unit, and we resumed our movement towards the Black Sea. All morning the fighting with the enemy, entrenched on a high railroad embankment and fiercely resisting, did not cease. Four times we rushed to the attack, and all four times were thrown back to the original positions. The battalion commander was tearing and throwing, not shy in expressions. Company commanders came to despair. Artillery support, which we insistently asked for, we did not receive. Instead, they sent us a regiment of Hungarian hussars. We could laugh if we did not want to cry. But we were wrong. Squadron after squadron of hussars lined up in battle order. A command sounded, the tall colonel drew his sabre from its sheath, and all this mounted mass rushed across the wide open field at the enemy, flashing their naked blades. Forgetting our caution, we jumped out of the trenches to better observe the unprecedented spectacle unfolding before our eyes like a motion picture. Strangely enough, only single shots were heard against the rushing avalanche. Then, not believing our eyes, we saw how the Russians, who until then had been repulsing all our attacks with the stubbornness of fanatics, rushed in panic to escape. A merciless chopping of the fleeing men began. The nerves of the Russian men could not endure the terrifying glitter of the blades gleaming in the sun. Simple natures were crushed by simple weapons. Having loaded on the vehicles, we again rushed after the retreating enemy, but with the onset of darkness we lost contact with him. Shortly before this, it became known that the two right-flank German companies, carried away, went too far ahead and for quite a long time have not been in touch, although they have radios at their disposal. Our battalion was ordered to go in search of them and, if necessary, to help them join the main forces. We travelled until nearly midnight, several times running into small armed groups of the enemy, who again loomed somewhere in the vicinity. We found no sign, however, of the two vanished companies. Finally, when we reached a huge cherry orchard, the commander ordered us to halt for the night. The battalion immediately took up a circular defence, having hastily set up temporary positions. Listen, I said to the messenger who had given the order, but there's a stifling corpse odour in here. What's the matter? I heard suddenly, to my surprise and fright, the commander's harsh voice. Where do you think some corpses could have come from? You'd better go to bed, that's the best thing for you now. Listen, I said to the messenger who had given the order, but there's a stifling smell of corpses in here. What's the matter? I heard suddenly, to my surprise and fright, the commander's harsh voice. Where do you think some corpses could have come from? You'd better go to bed, that's the best thing for you now. I wrapped myself in my tent and fell into a deep, dreamless sleep. I awoke to a rough tap on my shoulder. Dawn was barely breaking. The old man demands you. Hurry up. You were damn right, the battalion commander said as I ran into headquarters, out of breath. Come and admire. Not far from the command post, in a shallow hollow lined with cherry trees, a cluster of soldiers were gathered, talking excitedly among themselves. I pushed through the crowd and recoiled in horror at what I saw. It was not cherries hanging from the trees, but German soldiers, barefoot, with their hands tied behind their backs. All talk had stopped. In the centre of the nearest small village, several prisoners of war captured the day before were digging a common grave. The crowd increased. More officers and soldiers came. When the grave was ready, the prisoners were ordered to carry the bodies of the hanged men into it. In a state of complete apathy with a blank stare, they heaped the stiffened bodies on their backs and carried them along the narrow corridor of the lined honour guard. In the meantime, the officers and privates of the battalion to which the two unfortunate companies belonged had also joined the crowd. My God! exclaimed the non-commissioned officer standing next to me. That's my own brother Carl. He drew his pistol and the echo of the shot rang out, and the prisoner who had been carrying his brother fell to the ground dead. 
Another prisoner of war silently and just as idly lifted Charles, and the procession resumed its movement. A captain of some sort covered the non-commissioned officer. Easy, boy, he said. I understand how you feel, but this isn't just about you. With a slow movement, as if in a dream, the non-commissioned officer put his pistol into his holster. What will I write to my mother? He muttered, as if talking to himself. I was supposed to look after him, the youngest. We heard the story of what happened from local residents, eyewitnesses to the events. When the two company commanders were convinced that the soldiers had used up all their ammunition and that there was nowhere to expect help, they decided to surrender, about a hundred men in all, expecting humane treatment. What followed is already known. By this time, Soviet soldiers had already gotten rid of illusions about proletarian brotherhood and were taking revenge for the atrocities committed by the Germans and their allies on our land. Ed. We began to pursue the enemy at noon. He took the battle, which was unusually fierce, but in the end the enemy's units were scattered, unable to withstand the blow of our valiant troops. There were still rare shots and bursting of single shells on a wide field of ripe golden sunflowers, illuminated by the rays of the setting sun, but the battle was over. But the and again the superior enemy forces retreated, unable to resist the selfless courage of the German soldiers. The Germans had a significant advantage in manpower and equipment. Ed. And again, walking down the long street of the German settlement of Novaya Dancia, I observed the same picture as near Kiev, near the Dnieper and the Black Sea, villages without men. I talked to the landlady of the house where I had been assigned to stay. My husband? she asked in surprise. He was taken by the Reds one night four years ago. Since then I know nothing about him. My brother was arrested as a spy. No one knows who he was spying for. He was taken away with my husband and sentenced to ten years of corrective labour. Not a line from them since then, and I was left with six children in my arms. I don't know if they are alive. I don't know anything about them at all. Oh God, what a life, the woman sobbed. And my son is in a correctional labour camp in Siberia, added my landlady's neighbour. At times it seemed impossible to endure such events and experiences, that they were beyond human strength. Nevertheless, the horrors of the Eastern Campaign had shaken us up, brought us out of our complacency and complacency, reminded us again of the ideals for which we had stood. They had regained their former glory, and every little thing only confirmed the rightness of our national socialist ideas. Good evening, interrupted my thoughts by a thin child's voice. What time is it? Automatically I answered, but then froze in place. How many thousands of German settlers were destroyed in prisons and camps, this paradise of labourers? How many villages and hamlets in the Ukraine and on the Volga were left without a male population? And now, after twenty years of oppression, a little girl stops me on a village road with the question, what time is it now? Only this morning I was bursting with pride at our quick victory. But now I suddenly realised that our victory was just another milepost on the road to progress for all mankind, a road that has no end and will go on forever. I continued my walk along a rural street shrouded in the evening twilight. Near a dilapidated school, a group of captured Soviet soldiers from Central Asia were singing something mournful in their native language. In the song one could hear a longing for distant mountains and valleys. Someone's thin laughter came from the darkness from the direction of the collective farm sheds. The night peace was disturbed by the measured footsteps of a patrol. In my pocket I fumbled for a photograph of a strange woman. Tomorrow I would hand it to the clerk's office for forwarding to the military unit in which the murdered soldiers had served. When we had just occupied this German village and were still combing through the buildings, an old man came up to me and pulled me by the sleeve. Right there he whispered. That's where they lay. Before I could ask what was wrong, he had already led me through a small vegetable garden to the abandoned chalk quarries on the border of the Lenin collective farm. Here, he mumbled, tears streaming down his wrinkled cheeks, we brought up prisoners with shovels. They removed large pieces of rock and started digging. 
Soon a German army boot was exposed, and then a dead German soldier. There were six of them in all, cut off from their unit and fighting to the end before being captured. They were interrogated at Red Headquarters, but they were silent. They were interrogated again, but they did not utter a word. There was placed on the edge of a chalk quarry. The Russian general was also present. The six knew what awaited them and looked the general straight in the face. One of them took a picture out of his pocket, a picture of his wife. With it in his hand, he died. And the women of this German settlement stood at a distance and wept. The bodies of those shot were hastily pelted with stones. The first Waffen SS assault troops had already appeared at the edge of the nearby forest. Edge of For a long time we stood in silence over the bodies of our dead comrades. An army flask, some soldiers' identification badges, and a photo card were lying nearby. I picked it up and walked with a quick step along the street. As I walked away, I heard the clanking of shovels against stone behind me. This time the prisoners were preparing a decent burial for the dead. It was quite late when I returned to my apartment, but none of my colleagues had gone to bed. Do you still have the picture? One of them asked, slightly embarrassed. I nodded, and they looked at the picture for a long time, passing it from hand to hand. It was not in the nature of soldiers to show their emotions openly. We had looked into the eyes of death too often to talk aloud about the heroism and cruelties of war. At he this evening we were especially careful to clean our weapons. At dawn we again attacked the superior. See note above. Ed. Forces of the enemy broke through his last lines of defence and pushed the remnants to the Black Sea coast. The next day at about noon, our division headquarters received an order to shoot all prisoners of war captured by us in the last three days as retaliation for the inhuman treatment of captured German soldiers. And, as if on purpose, it was during these unfortunate days that about 4,000 people were captured by us. They listened silently, without raising their eyes, with fixed faces, to the interpreter who told them of the fate that awaited them. The prisoners were placed in rows of eight at the edge of the anti-tank ditch. When the first volley was fired, all eight men fell down as if knocked down by a giant fist. But the next batch was already lining up. It was strange to see how these doomed men were making use of their last few minutes in this world. One, for example, carefully folded his overcoat and laid it next to him on the ground before making his final journey. Perhaps he hoped that his overcoat would still help to keep someone from the cold, or perhaps he had grown accustomed to taking care of things. Others greedily took a last drag from a scrap of newspaper. No one tried to write farewell lines to their relatives. Suddenly one of the condemned, a tall Georgian or Ossetian, grabbed a shovel lying on the ground near him and hit him on the head with force. No, not the German soldier who was nearby, but the Red Commissar who was standing nearby. Bolshevik, damned, he said, panting. The captain in command of the execution approached him and asked, Officer? Yes, the Caucasian replied. Follow me, the captain ordered and tried to pull the Caucasian aside. But the man guessed the captain's intentions and shook his head proudly. Here is my front, he said slowly, pointing to the dead comrades. Then, throwing away his cigarette, he took a place in a row at the edge of the anti-tank ditch. Chapter 3. Around the Black Sea to Mariupoli The retreat of the Red Army units of the southwestern and southern fronts gradually turned into a panic flight. Defeated after defeat, Marshal Budioni, commander-in-chief of the troops of the southwestern direction in July, September 1941, Edamot E. Dates, a famous hero of the Civil War, showed himself to be an insufficiently skilful military leader, poorly versed in matters of strategy and tactics, as well as Marshal Timoshenko. In July, September, he commanded the troops of the Western Front, at the same time Commander-in-Chief of the troops of the Western Direction. Ed. The next morning we had already reached the outskirts of Kherson. The Russian artillery, supported by the ship's guns of the Black Sea Fleet, was firing hurricane fire, but the shells fell far to our left, practically doing us no harm. On the railroad tracks stood a train of flat cars loaded with T-34 tanks which had never been in battle. 
Our commander had not yet made a decision regarding further advance. In the city in several places, fires were burning. Often came the rumble of powerful explosions. Ammunition depots were blown up. Finally, a young Austrian officer was assigned to scout the nearest city block. I want you to accompany me, he informed me over the phone. Our motorcycle roared through the deserted streets. No sign of the enemy. There were burning buildings here and there. As we turned a corner, we saw a frightened elderly man in civilian clothes running toward the nearest house. Stop! Stop! The stranger froze like a stump on the spot. When I approached him, I tried to question him, using the extremely meagre supply of Russian words I knew. As he claimed, there were no Red Army soldiers in the neighbourhood. Stores? Wine? Schnapps? Oh yes, the man smiled. You can find it on the right around the corner in a large brick building. There are also, he continued, the NKVD cellars. We will not take this old man prisoner, said the Austrian officer, but let's at least provide him with a bottle of wine. Let's go and see. We saw the building we wanted at once. The gates were open wide and without hesitation we drove into the narrow passage leading into the courtyard. And then my heart sank. The courtyard was full of armed Red Army soldiers, forty or fifty of them. The narrow passage did not allow us to turn around. The officer raised his machine gun. The Red Army did not move. I got off the saddle, approached the nearest soldier and asked in broken Russian, Do you want cigarettes? Real German cigarettes? Yes, yes. The faces of the soldiers lit up happily. I held out a pack of cigarettes and we smoked. I watched out of the corner of my eye as the Austrian automatic rifle at the ready helped the driver turn the motorcycle around. My heart was still clenching anxiously. The war is over, I said. Stalin is bad for Russia. The Red Army soldiers around me grinned and nodded in agreement. One of them brought me a full ladle of wine. I drank half of it and handed the rest to the lieutenant. Oh, God, he laughed, already calmed down. Where the hell did that come from? I asked my Russian friends, and they pointed to a gloomy entrance to the cellar. With a glance at my companions standing by the motorcycle, I followed the three or four red soldiers into the dungeon with mixed feelings. My guides lit matches and dimly illuminated a rather vast room filled to the knees with wine. I pointed to a small barrel, and my Russian assistants rolled it out into the courtyard with cheers. Then we loaded the keg onto the motorcycle, which grunted as it took on the extra weight. Before we started on our way back through the fire-ravaged streets, I suggested that the Red Army men lay down their arms, promising to return soon. As soon as we had time to hand the wine to our commander, the order came to go on the offensive. In just a few minutes our soldiers were hastily rolling out barrels of NKVD wine. Helping Russians, we then left at our unit and used for various kinds of work. Thus, this wine brought them happiness. Kherson was for us the first real seaport we occupied in Soviet Ukraine. Odessa, which was in the deep rear of the advancing Germans and Romanians, successfully repelled all enemy assaults from August 5 to October 16, when the defenders of Odessa, 86,000, were evacuated by ships to the Crimea. Ed. Until then, we came across only villages and small towns, which we passed by or fought for in the course of operations. In Kyerson, a different Russia appeared before my eyes. The population behaved, though reserved at first, but generally friendly, freed from the unbearable pressure of the commissars, who for the last few days had behaved as if they were madmen off the chain. The children, who were sniffing around in large numbers, helped to establish contact between us and the intimidated population. The main role was played by sugar. Even here, in the rich Ukraine, an almost unaffordable treat for ordinary people. The local girls were friendly, but behaved with dignity and decorum. At first I got acquainted with an elderly woman who, to my surprise, spoke fluent German. She came from a German settlement in the Volga region. Satisfied that I had found someone with whom I could talk freely, I invited her to visit me at my allotted apartment. 
At first, she hesitated whether to accept my invitation, but then she agreed. I and two other soldiers were given a large room to stay in, the previous occupants having fled across the Dnieper before our arrival. What do I have to tell you about? The woman said somewhat solemnly after the first cup of tea. After all, you won't understand the soul of a Russian person anyway. For that, you need other measures. For centuries, Russians have been imposed alien to them cultural traditions of other peoples. And the Russian man always wanted to get to the bottom of things, to get to the roots. That's how he lived under the Tsars, and that's how he lived after Lenin tried to transplant alien Marxist ideas about life to Russian soil. But since you want to listen to me, it would be better if I told a true story. When I was young, I developed a close relationship with the Laval family from Marseille. Pierre Laval had his own import-export firm in Odessa, where I was brought up in the best boarding school for noble maidens. By chance, I met his wife Marguerite Laval, who was ten years older than me, but younger than her own husband. We soon became friends. But then came the spring of 1919. Rather shattered remnants of the White Guard military units in disarray retreated to Odessa, subjected to continuous attacks of the Reds. The officers of the Entente occupation forces, especially the French, requisitioned with feverish haste all the vessels in the port, from warships to transports and boats. They stocked up on whatever fuel and food they could find, then loaded their soldiers onto the ships, forcing them to run down the gangways and the shells of the Reds were already bursting in the streets of Odessa, driving the retreating white guards. Soon the Red Army soldiers broke the last pockets of resistance, and on April 6th entered the defeated and devastated city. On August 24th, 1919, Odessa was again occupied by the Whites, and on February 8th, 1920 again and finally by the Red Army. Ed. From that moment, the commissars and Czechists began to do their bloody work. Shootings began, which lasted for several days. However, the number of counter-revolutionaries accumulated in the city was so great that even the commissar Czechists did not know how to deal with such a mass of people doomed to death. In the end, many were loaded onto three old cargo ships decommissioned for lack of use, taken several kilometres from the coast and, tied up in pairs, thrown into the sea without trial. Among the unfortunates were white officers, members of parties hostile to the Bolsheviks, ministers of religious worship, former Tsarist officials, and even representatives of the working people. However, the bodies of the drowned continued to float on the surface, and with the tide they were washed ashore. Therefore, metal objects were subsequently tied to the legs of those who were thrown into the water. However, the bodies of the drowned persons continued to float on the surface, and with the tide they were swept ashore. Therefore, metal objects were subsequently tied to the legs of those being thrown into the water. Pierre Laval, who had no time to evacuate in the confusion that prevailed at that time, stayed with his wife and children in Odessa and was arrested by the Bolsheviks during the mass raids. In vain, Laval assured in his non-involvement in politics in vain he proved his French citizenship. Before his family could reach the chief commissar, Pierre was taken to one of the three ships and thrown into the sea with the others. His wife Margarita still managed to get herself accepted by the Reds' Commissariat of Internal Affairs. Finding herself in an awkward position, the Soviet government quickly gave her permission to find her husband's body. The task was made easier by the fact that Pierre Laval was wearing a white suit at the time of his execution. It was a glorious summer morning. Madame Laval stood silently beside the diver, whose name was Grigory Ivanovich, as the boat took them to one of the three ships still anchored in Odessa harbour. By eleven o'clock, the sea had calmed down sufficiently, and the diver was able to go underwater in relatively shallow water. The pumps were running rhythmically. Margarita stared steadily at where the diver had disappeared. A nearby representative of the Red Militia kept his eyes on his wristwatch. But not three minutes later the alarm was sounded from the depths, and the sailors quickly brought the diver aboard. Outwardly no damage was visible on the diving suit, 
but when the helmet was unscrewed, they saw that Grigory Ivanovich was dead. The stunned, speechless sailors huddled over the dead body. Madame, said the Czechist who had led the search, after all attempts to bring Grigory Ivanovich back to life had failed. As you can see, it was an accident. We have granted your request, and I can't help you any further. But isn't there another diver on the ship? The Czechist looked questioningly at the sailors standing around him, who recoiled in fright at his gaze. Citizens, said Madame Laval, I will pay ten thousand roubles to the person who returns my husband's body to me. Ten thousand roubles, I heard an incredulous whisper. As much as ten thousand roubles. Make up your minds quickly, said the Czechist. The Frenchwoman will keep her promise, I guarantee it. The stoker, who had dared to dive, watched calmly as the diving suit was pulled off the dead man. Then, without a word, he pulled it on and disappeared under the water. Ring by ring the cable was evenly unwinding, and the dotted line of air bubbles rising from the depths indicated that the new diver was making steady progress toward the very spot where the drowned men were supposed to be. And again the unfortunate Frenchwoman kept her eyes on the surface of the sea, and again the Czechist who was present counted down the fateful minutes. Suddenly there was a desperate tug on the signal rope. The sailors grabbed the rope in unison, and soon the stoker was back on board. When they took off his helmet, they saw blood and foam coming from his nose and mouth. He waved his eyes wildly. What's the matter? The Czechist got angry. Are you crazy? Ten thousand roubles, shrilled the stoker. There are ten thousand dead people walking on the bottom of the sea. Priests, bourgeois, generals and soldiers. He started rolling around on the deck, screaming and waving his arms frantically. Such mass drownings were especially practised after the occupation of the Crimea by the Red Army on November 6th, 1920. The Red Army occupied the Crimea on November 6th, 1920, when tens of thousands of soldiers of Wrangel's Russian army, as well as tens of thousands of Russian peaceful refugees, believing the promises of amnesty, surrendered and were brutally murdered by teams of executioners under the leadership of emissaries from Moscow, Bela Kun and Rosalia Zemlyachka. Did you hear that, comrade? There's a man lying here in the hospital who saw them. Who saw who? Dead people, the woman explained, coming out of the bakery with a loaf of bread she had received on assignment. And in the midst of them stands a priest with his hair flying and his hands raised to the sky, cursing us and our city. They're all wandering the seabed, hear me, stoically. Rumours of the wandering dead spread from house to house, penetrated the Red Army barracks, in the prison cells of those sentenced to death, crawled through the narrow crooked alleys and slums of Odessa where the proletariat lived. 